welcome again uh, hope you had a good lunch and i know it can put some people to sleep but if you want to sleep please do not close your eyes you know okay i think let's start our afternoon session and um Mr. Roshi Badain, uh, the Honorable Minister of Financial Services, was to come uh, on uh, phone and video, but uh, it looks that his parliament session is going on, uh, the budget session, so he would be coming up a little later. As soon as it is finished, it's, uh, he's in Mauritius, and uh, he was actually to be with us. But unfortunately, this parliament session has come up and he's still there. And as soon as he's free, maybe he will give us a call. And uh, in any case, we will <coughs> discuss some of those uh, treaty related issues in the uh, panels uh, that will follow this afternoon. So, uh, what uh, we would do is to deal with some of the issues in relation to setting up a fund. As you all know that we uh, deal a lot with life cycle of the fund and the fund industry relevant to India. And uh, <clears throat> so setting up issues, fund formation, fund uh, governance, fund investments, fund exits, and so on and so forth, and across all classes of assets. So we'll, this afternoon, we'll discuss uh, issues related to venture capital funds, private equity funds, hedge funds, and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I would, what uh, I would like to do is to invite uh, my colleagues, um, Pratibha Jain, can you just join us? You introduced her in the morning. She's part in charge of Delhi office and at the same time heads the funds and regulatory practice. Uh, Richie Sancheti, he leads our fund formation practice uh, based out of Mumbai. And uh, Mansi Set, she does uh, funds and tax in particular, uh, besides, of course, the other corporate work out of a New York office. She's an international tax expert here. So I think uh, we will start with uh, Pratibha. I know you've flown in this morning straight from Mumbai and arrived into New York. This is by Delhi. I know for Mumbai people, I know. it's all Mumbai centric, but. Ah, I, I think I get your point. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I think um, uh, we think it's all the same. So it's a borderless world. So um, uh, I'm from Delhi, she's from Mumbai. And uh, am I right? Sure. Okay. So, um, but uh, it would be nice to hear from you, Pratibha. How do you see the current environment? Uh, for raising commitments uh, for India Focus Fund. You've done some interesting stuff as well, but we'll discuss that in a separate session. Sure. Go ahead. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we'll try and keep you awake as far as possible. I thought, uh, you know, I'll talk more about uh, uh, the macro situation in India currently. Um, you know, I assume a lot of people here and had the pleasure of meeting people during lunch. Um, people seem to be focused more on, um, you know, cross-border work between India and U.S. Um, so I thought I'll give a sense, especially sitting in Delhi, um, I see a lot of the policy initiatives of the government very, very closely. In fact, um, you know, the one benefit, uh, the disadvantage you already see, you know, the Mumbai ones, forget tend to forget that you're based in delhi but the big advantage of um, sitting in delhi is that you um, see the uh, you get a sense of where the economy is heading towards and what what um, the government's uh, 
view which is very important in a in a country where you know we are we are still very uh, comparatively centrally controlled in terms of business, um, we get a very good sense of what to expect. In fact, uh, last year itself, we had started telling people when there was a lot of negative noise on India that uh, the government's uh, making a lot of claims, but we are not seeing any action. Um, and you know, we were seeing in Delhi the ministries working on an overdrive, uh, the bureaucrats working till late, um, taking inputs on policy changes, drafting new regulations, policies, laws. Um, and we were telling people already last year that uh, you know expect the positive changes to come soon, and by next year you'll be telling us how you know India is heating up. Um, and it was a little difficult for people to believe. And now today, you know, when I was talking to people in the morning or during lunch, um, thankfully we are we are hearing people talking about that. Uh, people have seen the. Um, uptick in the Indian economy, have seen the government deliver on policy change, uh, loosening up on uh, uh, the FDI restrictions. Um, all of that has significantly helped uh, fundraising uh, potentials for India. And uh, you know, in the panel later, we'll talk about what those changes exactly are. But overall, we have seen this first uh, half of the year actually being uh, there being a lot more cash, again, following deals uh, compared to the last two years, I would say. Um, and the numbers seem to support that. Um, again, India focused funds, uh, per se, we have seen probably a downturn rather than a uh, upside in uh, raising India focus funds, but uh, the commitment to India uh, in terms of global funds um, seems to be increasing uh, just by the number of deal activities uh, compared to the previous two years. In terms of India focus funds, uh, you know we believe the reason for uh, it being less than comparatively the previous years is because you still see a lot of the money that has been raised still sit, sitting there, um, and deals only getting done now, um, rather than the fact that uh, if people went out to raise, they wouldn't be able to raise. Um, so we are actually expecting India Focus Funds to um, the, the activity to increase next year. Uh, we see a lot of our clients, uh, GPs, looking at raising funds next year uh, rather than this year. But we do see investment activity increasing, and uh, the government um, pa policy changes pretty much having come to a head uh, with the recent uh, FDI restrictions being uh, 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 changed to be less restrictive. Um, we are expecting a few more policy changes here this year, uh, which will again help FDI both investments uh, into India and raising funds. For example, um, we were recently called for a meeting where the government is looking at uh, introducing uh, changes to the instruments that foreign investors can use to invest in India and making them uh, less restrictive again. Um, currently, you can only do compulsorily convertible in terms of hybrid instruments. Government's looking at allowing other types of in instruments to do that, which is all uh, going towards showing that uh, the government itself is very keen for foreign investment to come in. And they recognize the role of private equity and venture capital, um, uh, the focus on innovation, the setting up of India Aspiration Fund, um, the uh, the uh, prime minister's focus himself on um, the startup uh, India program, uh, all of that um, you know makes us feel that the next two years, and you know we are seeing uh, that already, the next two years are going to be um, very good for uh, investments into India and raising funds for investing into India. Uh, Richie, would you like to add anything to the no, sir, question? I think, uh, how is the environment? And no, I think uh, I'll just uh, put some number and empirical context to what Pradipa already indicated. 
So while we saw the Asia Pacific funds, the allocations to them decreased by about 14%. Uh, allocations to India fund were only down by about 8 to 9%, uh, largely driven by the fact that a lot of institutional participation at a global level had already been made by some of the top tier GPs. Uh, given the global trend, something which impacts not just India-focused funds, but all sorts of funds globally. Uh, LPs today are rationalizing the relationships that they have. So they are looking to sort of drive down the number of GP relationships that they cater to. But these relationships are getting much and much more deeper. So in addition to you know just participating in a fund sponsored by their favorite GP, they also uh, you know uh, participate deeper by co-investment structures, etc. So there, there is a lot of uh, LP allocation that was made to India-focused funds uh, when there was a change in the regime as far as the government is concerned. Uh, but what has also happened, and again to, to put in some more context to what Pradhaba indicated, uh, what we have seen is definitely there has been a valuation write down as far as uh, technology companies are concerned. As far as consumer companies are concerned, there has been sort of uh, uh, writing down on valuation, etc. What was also another feature that we observed uh, late last year and beginning this year has been the fact that some of the initial funds which were making allocations to India were primarily raising commitments from global LPs. The Indian HNI segment, the Indian family offices, they were pretty much missing out on all the action, all the value that was created out of India. So what we now see is that while the global LPs are looking at other opportunities, we are looking at so many factors impacting global markets, uh, we see the Indian LP segment really come up to pace and uh, what we are seeing is a lot of fund managers actively looking at India raising strategies where they engage with the family offices, they are raising meaningful commitments from India. Uh, Amit sort of mentioned in the earlier panels that how uh, uh, SIDBI has come up with the India Aspiration Fund. Uh, NABARD, which is another government institution, has also come up with its own fund of sorts, where what they do is they bring in matching commitments to a fund set up by the, the fund managers in India. What this means is that it has never been better time for an Indian GP or a, or a spin out of an existing GP structure to set up an India focused fund and we see a lot of activity there. So, so clearly, you know, we as fund councils are advising GPs who are, you know, setting up these structures. And, uh, you know, we see a lot of uh, differentiations in the terms being offered, the kind of uh, engagement that the GPs are having with the LPs, etc. Some of which actually show out in some of the documentation we are doing for setting up the funds. Uh, that, I think, is a summary of where we see the industry today. Just changing uh, the format of our discussion, anybody from the audience would like to comment on this subject? Uh, uh, how do you see the environment uh, for fundraising? If anyone has any comment, feel free to <coughs> indicate. I can make one. Yeah. So um, we are sort of different from uh, what's being discussed, which is more private equity and venture capital. Mm -hmm. We focus more on hedge fund capital, which is public. And uh, I'd like to, you to expand on the whole GAR situation because Quite frankly, uh, trying to get LPs to pool in Mauritius is like pulling teeth versus Caymans or... Uh, we'll take up that question, I that's, thought. So that's uh, my sure, question, sure. I guess. That's we a very specific question, but with that, it's more know, about it's the environment and you know, what you think. And we, we have absolutely specific uh, you <laughs> know, uh, rationale to explain what we are seeing, why we are seeing what we are seeing, etc., which we will take up through subsequent questions within this panel itself. Yeah. But on fund environment, if anybody has any comment, otherwise we'd love to have that. But if not, then uh, maybe. But even even in the hedge fund industry, sorry, you know, we've only been talking about PEVCs, but um, I think as a firm, we have probably uh, advised the maximum mm -hmm. hedge funds that have been set up in India. And uh, again, there's been a huge uh, uptick there because of the, you know, where the market is and where the market is expected to be. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen very uh, different innovative structures being created onshore uh, because of the pain of, uh, you know, pulling offshore also. Um, there's a lot more regulatory work that can be done to encourage that market onshore, but we've been able to do, 
you know, a few, even in the current instruction, we can, we can discuss. In fact, I'll just conclude that, and of course, we are dealing with it in much more detail later on. But I think it's been, uh, it's been one of the most exciting times, even for setting up hedge funds, especially in view of the protocol, because what the feedback that we have been getting with some of the clients is that they actually appreciate the fact that there's a lot more clarity out there. All this while we were talking about Mauritius Treaty, the protocol, the risk, etc. Now that overhang is off the structure, so to speak. That's number one. Number two, while we see that on the illiquid investment strategies, it's been clearly the Nexus, the IDGs, the Sequoias who are you know raising a Series three, Series four fund. But as far as uh, liquid investment strategies are concerned, we in fact see first time fund managers also actually coming up. They go live with their structure, even with a three, four million, five million dollar as low as that sort of a corpus, and just you know try to ensure that they get a track record going and then get a more meaningful, deeper participation by some of the other LPs. So clearly the two universes don't really you know, uh, go parallel as far as uh, the LP perception is concerned. But frankly, the hedge fund has been one of the brighter spots uh, as far as uh, India's story is concerned. So we'll obviously be touching upon it. Upon sure, it. sure. So uh, uh, let me turn to the VC investment, you know. And uh, Rishi, if you can uh, tell a little bit about what are the themes for VC funds operating with uh, an India focus? Right, so I think as far as the themes are concerned, they continue to be what they were. I think what we are seeing is clearly a lot more pressure on fees. Uh, one clear uh, shift that we have been seeing is that uh, unlike you know uh, earlier years where we used to see a lot of club deals, where a lot of GPs were combining together, I think what we are now seeing is emergence of co-investment structure, something that we saw in a very increased uh, you know, basis in 2015, and it's just going deeper and deeper in 2016. What is happening is that yes, co a co investment opportunity to an LP is a GP's reaction to the pressure on the fees. Whereas the LPs, like I indicated, they're rationalizing the relationship, so they handpick two or three GPs, you know, whom they want to participate deeper, and accordingly, they see co investments as a great way of doing it. Uh, the only interesting bit is that you know co-investments in India today technically is absolutely similar to you know uh, sharing a cab ride. So uh, before you get in the cab, you check whether the car is right, the seats look good or not. So you look at who your GP is. Then you want to make sure that you are entering the cab first before the other passengers sort of come in. So as an LP, you want to make sure that you have the first right towards co-investment. Then you also want to make sure that the sponsor whom you are trusting, he's the one on the driver's seat so that the other co-investors don't sort of, you know, um, uh, come in with their own, uh, you know, uh, agendas, etc. And then similarly, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's been like, you know, once you're off, you ensure that there's complete alignment between all the co-investors and, you know, the entire uh, structure moves forward in a very coherent manner. So yeah, I think, I think these are some of the themes that we have been seeing so far. I think uh, you know we can uh, move on to the next question since uh, um, you sure. know. Um, yeah. to, let let me just uh, briefly talk about um, the uh, emerging structures in India currently. Uh, you know, there's been a question already raised on um, w what's happening with GAR and the the regulatory environment currently in India. Um, the Again, you know, coming back to Delhi, the the mood specifically uh, in Delhi is to move the industry onshore uh, of uh, investment managers rather than having it offshore. Similar to you know how they pushed uh, the regime from ODIs to registering as uh, uh, for foreign portfolio investors, so that the government could regulate you and have a market onshore. Uh, rather than a, a, a market offshore that they had no control over. We are seeing a similar push uh, by the government for the the industry, the BVC industry. Uh, they want that job market to be in India. They, uh, they want more regulatory oversight. Um, and they, they want a greater visibility on what's happening in the Indian market. Uh, which is all sitting offshore right now in terms of pooling, and it really helped having uh, you know Mr. Jensen as uh, uh, the finance minister for state because he understood these issues, um, and uh, try as a result of you know a lot of discussion between the industry, there have been series of reforms in the last uh, few years 
couple of years, I would say, since the new government came in, uh, to create an uh, industry onshore. Um, the AIF structure, which existed uh, and came in force uh, with the previous regime, has actually been expanded in the last couple of years to make it more viable uh, to create an onshore market um, for pooling, uh, for investing, um, and that's what's making you know the possibility of GAR actually coming in um, higher next year. Till till last year, we were saying, "Ah, don't worry about GAR. You know, <laughs> the industry is going to push back, etc." But now that government's given an onshore alternative, we see them you know pushing ahead with it. But Mansi is going to talk more about that. But just talking about um, the AIF structure for for people who are not uh, familiar with it, this is the alternate investment uh, funds regime that um, is regulated by SEBI, um, and it's a structure by which um, you can create a fund in the form of either a trust or an LLP or a company yes. uh, and register it with SEBI, and uh, the manager is required to be onshore. Um, even though practically you have the option of setting it up as a trust or a company or an LLP, practically we've seen a company just doesn't work. It's regulatorily very heavy. Um, you know, then you're also uh, regulated under the Companies Act and with SEBI, and the regulatory nightmare uh, is immense. Um, for us, uh, the trust structure for setting up an uh, onshore AIF works very well, and that's how you know 99% of the funds are getting set up, and especially as for NDA, which kind of formed the trust structure in India with Nishit by doing the first one, it comes to us more naturally too. So uh, we've, we've seen most of these being set up as trusts. Uh, what happened last year was the government, uh, till date, if you were having foreign investment uh, into these uh, uh, trusts set up uh, under the supervision of SEBI, um, it was treated as FDI. So any investment through that pooling structure would be treated as an FDI investment. Um, which didn't, and that plus there was no clarity on getting a pass through for the trust, so there was a worry about double taxation. Um, both of these issues were uh, resolved to a certain extent last year. Uh, firstly, the government came out with a change by which if the manager is a domestically owned and controlled entity, so the uh, investment manager is owned and controlled by Indian residents, then even if 100% of the money that is pulled into the uh, local AIF, the entity is considered to be domestic. Um, so the funds will be treated as, as domestic funds and won't be treated as um, foreign direct investment into the country which means none of the pain that we're going to talk about in the next two sessions uh, would be applicable for any money that is coming in through, through that structure, which is a, which is a huge uh, benefit that uh, you can get by pooling locally. Um, all, all, but uh, um, the corollary to that is if the manager is then foreign-owned, then even if your money is totally domestic, it doesn't matter, it'll still be treated as FDI. So to the extent you can create a structure whereby the manager to the fund is uh, owned and controlled by Indian residents, um, in, in one sweep you do away with risk of GAR, risk of POEM, um, FDI issues, a um, lot of uh, um, the tax pass through also got resolved uh, in the last uh, budget where uh, tax pass through status was given to AIFs too. So it's given under uh, the Income Tax Act rather than previously where you know we were uh, arguing it uh, based on uh, previous court judgments. Um, because of which we have seen uh, significant, and you know, maybe Richie, you can take more details on the AF structure, but we've uh, seen, um, you know, a lot of our marquee clients uh,
taking a unified structure where you still do pull offshore, uh, you know, due to you know your Cayman issues and still needing a treaty jurisdiction, but um, having an AIF onshore uh, to be able to get all these benefits and uh, you know doing away with uh, the tax risk, which can be quite significant. Um, and this is just starting, uh, you know, this activity is just starting and we expect more and more uh, entities taking advantage of uh, the AIF structure. So if you hear in, in more of your discussions, you know, even uh, if you're uh, advising uh, GPs or um, in only in investments and not necessarily in fundraising, um, it's still a useful uh, structure to know of because you will see more and more people uh, talking about it um, and using it as a uh, uh, alternative to a pure offshore structure for India. Uh, Richie, I just uh, she talked about AIF uh, and some people may not be aware about different categories. Can you spend a minute or two just telling what uh, is AIF and what are the categories that people can uh, Sure, come? sure. So I think uh, just as a matter of brief background, you know, alternative investment funds or AIF that Pradhiba has been talking about is a recent enactment under 2012 legislation. All this while what we had in India were venture capital fund regulations. Uh, this did not take into account the different uh, segments in which a fund could invest, did not uh, take into account the different styles of investing, whether you are open end, close end. Are you investing in a different sort of asset class which does not uh, sort of go well with an open end structure, et cetera? So what had happened is the regulator, Securities Regulator India, SEBI, Securities and Exchange Board of India, they completely overhauled the entire regulatory framework in 2012, where they introduced three different categories of AIFs. The first one focuses only on those sectors which in government's perception have positive spillover effect on the economy. So category one AIF would be those focused on infrastructure, healthcare, social investments, etc. of the like. A category two alternative investment fund on the other hand were private equity funds, debt funds, uh, which again operated out of a close end fund model where you would have multiple closings and after that you have a you know investment period and then you sort of create exits. Whereas under category three AIF, which is the, the only three categories that we have, the government for the first time introduced what is an equivalent of a hedge fund in India, where now a fund manager could set up an open-ended platform where investors could come in on a monthly basis, redeem their positions on a quarterly basis, etc. You could have uh, the equivalent of a high watermark uh, to gauge uh, the performance uh, fee, etc. for the manager. Uh, and again, you can operate on a leveraged basis. So these were the three categories of AIFs, which frankly the government thought would usher the Indian fund management industry to the next level. All this while India focused funds were pretty much offshore structures coming out of Mauritius, Singapore, Netherlands, Delaware came in combinations for different LP requirements. But for the first time, a honest attempt was made to onshore the fund structures in India. And along with that, hand in hand, what the government also did was allow a good framework of tax pass through. So what you ha now had is a good structure to make investments, as well as what was from a tax perspective, a transparent entity. This we believe was one of the key, you know, uh, supporting pillars for, you know, really enhancing the onshore fund regime, because uh, what was always the issue was that, you know, you never know how the tax government would sort of behave. In fact, quoting Nishit by, uh, you know, in India, you don't, uh, not, you not only know your future, because the laws are retrospective, you don't even know your past sometimes. Okay. So, uh, so with the new regime, you know, we had a very robust tax platform, as well as a regulatory regime to sort of uh, fund managers to look into. But what now has recently started happening is despite not having any onshore fund raising strategies, let's say all your investors were offshore LPs, you could still operate out of an onshore AIF because all you now need is a domestic team which is managing or pretty much sponsoring the India fund. And like Pratipa indicated, the onshore AIF could pretty much work as an SPV to an off offshore fund or an offshore feeder vehicle, which allows you to sort of take into account the FDI restrictions. You can put them on the side. You could, you could, uh, you know, you could uh, translate all your LP rights, all their interests. If you're trying to design a rupee IRR for domestic investors, a dollar IRR for your offshore investors, you could pretty much work and you know document all the rights, all the economics in a very robust manner. So that is initially mm -hmm. what AF technically yeah, means yeah. today. 
Absolutely, I think. Uh, but that brings us to the next question on tax, and maybe Mansi, you can tell us uh, uh, what's the current environment and a uh, lot is happening. I understand in terms of tax treaties as well. So, if you can just give your thoughts. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, I think what Richie and Pratibha have been talking about is essentially there has been a push to strengthen the uh, Indian domestic fund industry and try to move things on ground as opposed to be offshore, which is now, oh, there are various ways in which a foreign investor or a foreign fund could look at investing in India. They could be pooling uh, abroad and then getting into the Indian AIF, or they could be directly investing into the country. So there are a few structures that you can explore when you're uh, looking at India-focused funds. But essentially, what is relevant uh, for foreign capital is relying on a tax treaty when you're making that investment. And one of the most significant changes, at least as far as tax is concerned from Indian perspective that has happened in the couple, uh, past couple of months, has been the renegotiation of the Mauritius Treaty. And I'm sure uh, uh, all of you have probably seen, heard, or read a lot about it in the last two months. But it is a pretty significant change. And why it is is because um, for the last 20 odd years or since India has opened up and we set up the first few funds, Mauritius has pretty much been the most popular jurisdiction from where the investments were routed. Of course now over time other jurisdictions came to the fore, the investments are made from Singapore or say Netherlands or Cyprus and other jurisdictions but Mauritius was the stronghold. At one point maybe 80% of the investment was made from Mauritius. Why Mauritius was used was because of the treaty that we had between India and Mauritius, which basically provided that when you were to exit, the gains that you would be taking from the country, they wouldn't be taxable in India, they'd be taxable in Mauritius. And you would basically be able to eliminate the 20% hit or 30% hit, depending on facts and circumstances, that would be applicable in India. Now the Indian tax authorities, and this treaty actually, we entered into it about say 30 odd years ago, it's been in use for about 15, 20 years. But for the last 10 years, the Indian tax authorities have been after it. They have been wanting to challenge these structures uh, and they used all ways possible, which resulted in a lot of litigation on this topic. But the courts had time and again always reiterated that your treaty simply provides that as long as you're a tax resident, you'll get the benefit. So time and again, they challenged it, but they were facing a wall. Finally, what has happened now, after almost 10 years of renegotiation, is that the government has succeeded in convincing the Mauritius government to come to the table and change the terms of that treaty. And what that has done is, now as long as you've invested in shares of an Indian company, uh, listed or unlisted, gains arising from, at the time of exit or at the time you dispose those shares will be taxable or at least subject to the tax laws in India. It will not be subject to the tax laws in Mauritius. So it, they've split it. Uh, they've basically turned it around. Um, it, what that means is you could have an, ex depending on whether you, how long you're holding it, what sort of uh, shares you're holding, listed or unlisted, you could have anything from 0% uh, to sometimes even 40% tax in India. So in that sense, it's a pretty significant change. But it doesn't only impact Mauritius. It also impacts Singapore because the treaties were linked. So essentially, whatever capital gains benefit was arising under the India-Singapore Treaty, given that the treaties were linked in the sense that if the Mauritius benefit goes away, so does Singapore, Singapore also comes into the same situation. And those two jurisdictions are now our highest FDI jurisdictions. Uh, and then not only is it India and um, um, Mauritius and Singapore, that Indian tax authorities have made it very clear that they want to close all sorts of routes which give this benefit to the investors that they're able to get a capital gains exemption, capital gains tax exemption. They want to make sure the structures are simpler. That's the message that India, Indian tax authorities, Indian government is trying to give and which goes hand in hand with what Pratibha and Richie have been saying. They want to rather say strengthen the domestic fund industry. We don't want you to create, get into creative structures. Um, and just simply uh, do direct investments. So but also, that um, they've made it also very clear that they will not only renegotiate with Singapore, they will open up renegotiations with 
every other tax treaty jurisdiction. So it's not like now we can go treaty shopping because um, at least in our conversations with them, they're like, anytime we went uh, to, let's say, Netherlands um, or Cyprus, they said, well, Mauritius has this great benefit. Now that Mauritius is gone, we are going to go and use that to negotiate with everybody. Right. So, like, for example, for Cyprus, they just issued a press release that they've already completed renegotiations. Now, Cyprus has actually been, in, was interesting around 2007 or so when a lot of real estate funds were using Cyprus. A lot of debt investments were made from Cyprus. But about a couple of years ago, India denotified or blacklisted, so to say, Cyprus. So that... For the last few years, Cyprus hasn't been used um, as much. We had a good treaty, interesting treaty. Uh, we had a good interest clause, so like I said, debt investments. But now what they've done is they've actually announced um, that they're going to lift the denotification with retrospective effect. So which is good news because all those investors who had invested in and their investments were sort of stuck because they didn't know whether they had a 30% hit or not. Now they, they can clearly exit that. But the other change is that they're saying they have renegotiated the treaty. It's going to be along the same lines as Mauritius and Singapore, which basically means that going forward, so 1st April 2017 onwards, you're not going to have the capital gains exemption. Um, what these, and to get a little bit more into the Mauritius details, because a lot of uh, people here I understand have Mauritius structures, what if you've already invested right now, so for the funds who are already set up and hold investments in India, they're grandfathered. So as long, whatever, in fact, not just now, up till 31st of March 2017, you're fine. You can exit at any point of time. The old rule will apply. Anything that is invested after 1st April 2017 is what is going to be subject to these new rules. There also, they've tried to give a sort of a transitionary period for about two years that will give you 50% rate, et cetera, if you can meet the limitation of benefit clause. But these rates, are, at least for private equity funds, the two-year period really doesn't mean anything. Long-term long -term benefit itself is only applicable after two years. So essentially, you're looking at a 10% uh, tax rate in India, and that's something to take into account. But what does that really mean? Does that mean that we don't need these structures anymore, or is it that we now really should come directly from US to India? I wouldn't say it is that simple. Simply for the fact that India, in, uh, one of the, uh, actually, India and uh, US don't have an investment protection treaty. They've been renegotiated, and there are talks of it moving and being entered into, but currently the status is that they don't have it. But India and Mauritius does, for example. Some of the other jurisdictions like Netherlands and India, they do have an investment protection treaty. And this actually becomes, it's a strong point to say why you're set up in these jurisdictions. And it's not that the arbitrage is not possible at all. Because yes, if you're making sh uh, investment in shares, possibly not. But if you're investing in other instruments, like debentures are going to become interesting, or any other hedge funds which are investing in other than shares, all of those instruments are actually fall in a residuary clause. So which means that for them, the capital gains situation remains the same. So you don't have a tax hit. It's only for the shares, the equity investments, that this is relevant. So it doesn't mean that people need to fold off all their structures in Mauritius or Singapore. It just needs to be looked at more carefully. What are your reasons for being there? And does it still make sense for you to be there? The other thing that's interesting is that a lot of times you have double layer structures, which you know, in terms of limiting risks or things like that, you'd want to explore where you have a, you know, main holding company and then you have SPCs which are set up. To the extent there's a double layer structure, again, it is possible that a transaction which is not an India level may get the treaty benefit and may not be covered. So the fact that they're renegotiating these treaties, yes, there's a lot of pressure. India has made it clear that they want uh, to tax these transactions, but that doesn't mean that these... Uh, jurisdictions have become completely irrelevant. There are still reasons for which we might need these structures and might want to use them. And uh, for debt structures, still Mauritius is the best? Yes. In fact, yes. So very important point. Um, until this renegotiation, the lowest that you could actually go on an interest withholding would be, say, about a 10% Indian tax cost. But Mauritius has renegotiated this point, and it's brought it down to 7.5% 
which makes it interesting if you're investing in debentures because debentures are actually not are going to fall in the residuary so if you're transferring debentures it doesn't qualify as a share so you're out of it and also any interest that you pull out will actually be subject to only a seven and a half percent in India which is the lowest it goes among all the treaties so from that sense what we're thinking is Mauritius is probably going to emerge for debt investments and as Pratibha had mentioned earlier right now the kind of instruments that you can invest in is limited in the sense it has to be compulsory convertible um, into equity. But the talks are that they're going to liberalize that. They've been liberalizing in general and even the instruments that you're going to be able to use to invest into India is going to um, be further opened up, further relaxed. So to the extent there are optionally convertible debentures and things like that, you can use those to invest. So I think Mauritius still, it doesn't mean that this is like the death knell or anything. There are still reasons why you'd want to go to Mauritius and invest from there. Yeah. And I think coming to the GAR, you know, so right. the domestic law now provides for general anti avoidance provision. But the interpretation is that if uh, there is a Trex treaty and if it contains what is called limitation of benefit article, then GAR will not be applied because GAR is general anti avoidance and now that you have specifically stated in the treaty that if you take this following steps, it will not be considered to be, uh, you know, abuse of the treaty. So in Mauritius's case, if you uh, say you have, to, you have to spend 29 uh, lakhs of rupees, I believe, uh, 2.9 million Mauritius rupees and some of the other conditions are there. So if you comply with those conditions, at least you know, you will get the benefit irrespective of their in existence agar. Also, there is another issue that whether domestic law can override the treaty. So, there is also a possibility of constitutional challenge uh, if uh, GAR is invoked to override the treaty. But those are right. the two but, uh, important uh, yeah, things. Yeah, and just to add on GAR actually, so it is coming in place um, next 1st April, but that doesn't, so it basically says your principal reason shouldn't be tax avoidance or basically using it for tax structuring but that doesn't but if you have other reasons and other justifications then it's not that you can't use these structures or every structure is going to be questioned so what that really means is that whatever documentation whatever justifications we write we have to be very careful in wording those things because like i was saying one example is relying on an investment protection treaty which actually turns out to be a really important thing because you're not going to be able to use that if you come directly from the us so you have a very strong reason why you want to use one of these jurisdictions that has a, a bilateral investment treaty with india so gar is coming and they will look into things so that it's clear that they're going to get into the substance of things but doesn't mean that you know, your st structures are uh, lacking that substance. In there fact, are reasons uh, why you're using it. Yeah. Uh, uh, interesting uh, situation is that because US and India do not have bilateral investment production treaty, that itself is a reason for somebody else to go to other jurisdiction in West India. And I think some of you read this morning, uh, over $6 billion have been ordered to be paid by Indian government uh, in the matter of Kane, uh, you know, international uh, arbitration uh, that happened under the bilateral investment production treaty because India brought in retrospective amendment and that caused harm to the investor from the UK. So UK, India have very good uh, <coughs> negotiated uh, bilateral treaty, investment production treaty, I'm not talking about tax. So they could invoke that and uh, the, uh, the international arbitration, uh, you know, uh, panel has uh, now ordered to uh, India to pay $6 Kane has, billion. Kane uh, claimed it, Nishabai. Kane, huh? Kane has claimed it. Exactly. It's a uh, Kane, you know, that Kane, Kane Vedanta case that happened. So, you know, you can see the clear impact. So, if you are a U.S. fund, you are a U.S. manager, right? If you ignore this bilateral investment production treaty, you know, it's something one would consider, you know, there could be different kind of situation that could arise because when you are acting as a manager, you are actually acting for and on behalf of the smallest investor who may be behind the fund because you have fiduciary responsibility. And um, so, so first thing is that before you talk about capital gains and returns and stuff like that, you will always consider whether investment itself is safe. 
So if somebody tells you, go to one of those African countries and, uh, you know, will you 100% return, but would you invest? Possibly not. Simply because you don't know whether your investment is safe or not. So same thing happens for a fund manager from the US. If you invest in India and your investment could be, you know, one is retrospective is only one aspect of the whole thing, but it could be nationalized, it could be, you know, subrogated or otherwise, uh, theoretically, not that it would happen or not, I'm not being judgmental on that. But there is a, a, a risk of, uh, you know, you have no remedy. Or in White but, case, uh, there was a delay in getting the judgment from Supreme Court on yeah. the basis of which they got a positive order. Right. So, same thing in case of Vodafone, for example, they have also gone for, um, we are special counsel to Vodafone at one time. So, uh, what has happened is that they invested through Dutch BV. Okay. Now, Netherlands and India have a good bilateral investment production treaty, and they could invoke that and it, the whole matter is sitting over there. So there is some remedy to resolve, if at all. But that, is, that by itself is a commercial reason why one would look at other jurisdiction to come into India. This is just to give a little feel of the GAR and stuff like that, and we can discuss separately. I don't take too much just time. But one the, more thing, yeah. Nishibai, on that, um, you know, to your and uh, Mansi's point, um, you know, when, when we're thinking of these structures, uh, oftentimes the email exchange itself becomes very dangerous because the email, uh, you know, from the manager will go like, um, how do I avoid car issues, right? Um, and that by itself, if it gets into the hands of the authorities, you know, can be um, itself grounds for <laughs> invoking car that, you know, you created the whole structure for avoiding tax. In fact, uh, the opening statement in Vodafone case was uh, uh, from the prosecution was that we'll show um, using one of the big four's memos on how the structure was all created to avoid tax. Um, so one thing that we point highlight is as lawyers, we do have privilege. So tomorrow, if there is an audit or there is a case based on which you know they ask for documentation, um, if if the advice is coming from a law firm, um, it's privileged, um, and you know you can on those grounds uh, uh, not share those that email exchange. Um, but that privilege is not available necessarily to you know other uh, consultants or for example big fours that do help with so you know even if you're engaging with a big four in this conversation it's useful to have your lawyers uh, doing that rather than you doing it directly um, you know we've seen this actually happen in few cases so we do highlight it to clients so i think uh, 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 you know it's important how do you form a team there's always an accountant there's always a lawyer but there are certain things how do you manage your communication and stuff like that? That are also very important uh, points. But one thing I always maintain these days is that anything you do can be on the front page of the newspapers tomorrow morning. Okay. So try to do everything that you think it, you could be on the front page. How it you will be, you, nobody knows. Can you withstand the scrutiny of media? That's the first thing. Can you withstand the scrutiny of public, second thing, and then of course the tax comes. So I would suggest that whenever you do any structure, it is no longer I often say, is about structure. Structure is very, you know, structural engineer and architect, there's little difference. So it's a more about architect. How do you really uh, put the whole story together so it looks, it smells good and people feel good about it. And one of the tricks is to write your recitals very well. Half the time I see that when you go on the whiteboard and draw structure, everybody does it, you know, what's different. But when it's translated into documentation, this is where the real art lies. Because uh, anybody, uh, whether it's text department or otherwise, they are not just going to look at structure. They are going to see what you have written in the document. And it's very important that this is properly articulated. And uh, so these are some of the things that I would uh, suggest uh, so that uh, obviously, you are not cheating, you are not doing anything wrong, but it could create a wrong perception if it is not done right way. And once it's wrong perception, then you get into, your, uh, into what I call a litigation. And then, of course, you succeed, 
uh, as you move forward, but uh, it's painful. And therefore, it's very important that right at the start only you are able to show this was the background in light of which we did this, this investment. If you are investing through Mauritius, it's very important to bring out that there is no bilateral investment protection treaty between US and India or, for, or Mauritius is very good negotiated treaty that itself is very critical. So, you know, um, articulation becomes um, very, very important. And, but I just want to, uh, we have spent enough time on this, uh, but I hope this is useful. Uh, and uh, Pradipa, can, can you uh, uh, take us through some of the changes, you know, uh, that make onshore structures a little more compelling? We are talking about cross-border and therefore treaty and all that, but I think what's happening, yeah. why onshore is also becoming somewhat yeah. important. Nishpai, we already discussed that while we had you on the call, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we, we, we talked about, um, you know, the um, recent changes that are pushing, uh, encouraging, uh, encouraged by the government currently to have a onshore structure, a unified structure uh, through NAIF. Richie, anything further in terms of uh, the onshore structures that you think we've missed? No, no, I think we have, uh, between you and uh, Mansi, we have uh, covered the both universes of uh, how these structures are compelling because it gives you good flexibility on making investments and how, uh, given the recent changes on the tax side, the entire structure seems to fit together very well. Do you I want think, to talk uh, about uh, Category 3 a little bit no, more? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, see, I think the only limited point is that uh, uh, foreign investors today technically may not have the same level of comfort compared to Indian investors uh, when they're directly investing into <laughs> India. So like Mansi indicated, we may still see a combination structure where you're pooling all your foreign investors in a Mauritius or, or a Netherlands or a, uh, you know offshore jurisdiction. And that structure in turn then invests in the India fund. Uh, we are still good three, four years away. We have been, uh, you know, we have closed funds uh, funds which went for uh, their final close also the earlier this year, which had DFI participation, sovereign participation, etc. Where again the theme was that yes, they are comfortable with an AIF structure being part of the overall framework. But at the same time today, the foreign investors still see a lot of comfort in tried, tested, very stable regimes, whether it is from a corporate law perspective or tax perspective, <laughs> in an offshore jurisdiction, like a Mauritius or, or some of the more established. In those cases, what we typically see is that if you have participation by US taxable investors, you pretty much do a check the box election at the Mauritius level so that it's a disregarded entity and you're, it's treated as a partnership. And accordingly, you know, the US taxable investors are able to sort of rely on the K1s or the 1099s, etc. Sort of uh, to sort of get the tax, tax uh, paid in India, uh, you know, as a creditable item for them. So these are things is where we see the structures sort of play out. And uh, on the last part on the category 3 AIFs, like we indicated, foreign investments now is allowed in all forms of uh, AIFs, including category 3. So you can always set up a hedge fund in India. Uh, the best part is the AIF in India could also engage in a leverage. Obviously, it is restricted because the regulator is yet to see the full color of how the leverage would pan out in the India set up fund. So about 2x of leverage is allowed on the open-ended positions uh, that the hedge fund is maintaining. Uh, but, but the interesting bit is that yes, you can do a very meaningful offshore participation also. So instead of setting up two different structures, one for offshore investors, another for India, uh, you know, LP participation, you could have a very robust single layer structure to cater to all different uh, LP requirements that you may be targeting. So. Also, because of the recent change, um, you know, earlier because um, the only route for foreign investment and in, even in a category three, you would be treated as FDI. So, you know, there were there were question marks on, uh, for example, the limits of applicable for for an FPI of a you know ten percent limit on an investment or you know on position limits, etc. Would those be applicable also to AIFs? Now, with the option of having a domestic investment manager, you can have a situation where you have foreign investors investing in a category three AIF and getting all the benefits that a, a local trader would have in terms of position limits, um, which is uh, something that uh, that we have seen, you know, some of our clients use 
uh, given the change in the regime. Right. I think I'll just add one more statement here that uh, unlike uh, other category 1 and category 2 AIF, if a category 3 AIF has foreign investment, then uh, they would expect that the onshore AIF also make its investments in line with what a foreign portfolio investor can. Uh, that is one clarification which they added only in respect of category 3 AIFs. And the second part is, like Pradabha indicated, if the obviously if the manager is uh, foreign owned or controlled, then the same category 3 AF will also have to be guided by the FDI policy in those very limited cases. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Hi, thank you very much. I had a question. Um, you know, you, you touched on how the AIF has was enacted in 2012, and then subsequently the government in 2013 targeted. 15 different sectors that they want those industries to grow by increasing the FDI limits. Um, given the structure of the AIF, plus also you're talking about the onshore funds, are there certain sectors that you as a firm have seen more of these structures investing into over the last, say, two years? I think I'll, I'll take a step and Pratipa, you can add to it. See, the, uh, the point is that, you know, we clearly do not advise GPs or, or you know, uh, strategic investors to come in through the AFs at this point in time. Uh, clearly, the government has opened up the AF platform to you know, encourage domestic fund managers. Uh, these essentially would still have to behave like a fund. So when I say an AIF is a fund, what I mean is that yes, you'll have to diversify into four different investment opportunities that an AIF is required to. You can't have a AIF mimicking like an SPV, where the sole reason for setting up the fund was just to invest, you know, make a very targeted investment. So those are not the structures that the regulations would sort of cater to. That is number one. And again, you know, uh, it is very tough to draw a line that if, let's say, a structure is being used for a strategic participation, that could be used as a precedent by a lot of other sectors also. So clearly, these sort of funds will have to be very carefully planned, how the management uh, team is sort of uh, devised, what is the LP participation, what sort of investments you're making. Because if you have a very strategic investor making a single strategic investment or uh, you know other investments just to meet the letter of the law, then we could see a lot of challenge, not just from the securities regulator, but other agencies of the government, including RBI, Ministry of Finance, etc. So those are clearly one, one space where we would be slightly more careful when we tread. But um, AIFs in general have been sector agnostic. Um, you know, we've uh, seen a lot of India-focused funds being raised through AIFs, which are sector agnostic. A um, lot of infrastructure funds that have been raised through AIFs, real estate funds that have been raised through AIFs, um, hedge funds. Uh, you know, which are investing in public equities. So um, to answer your question, not anything specifically, um, you know, given the FDI exemption, but again, the FDI, um, the change in regulation by which you can use this to get away with FDI is so new that those funds are just kind of, you know, getting formed now. So we, we'll see that trend coming through maybe by next year. So I think uh, uh, let's move on to something more as well. Uh, any particular structural consideration when a GP is looking uh, to raise commitment uh, from uh, offshore or India-based uh, LPs? Uh, Rich, you might have some perspective. No, I think uh, we've summarized yeah. some of these points uh, you know, in much granular detail. So clearly, if the audience has any further questions, happy to take it up. Otherwise. Uh, Okay. Uh, clearly, like we indicated, you know, uh, we see a lot of potential in AIFs. In fact, there was a Nayan Murthy Committee report which was made public earlier this year, to which our firm had contributed quite a bit. Okay. So there also the committee observes that, you know, uh, with That's opening up of AIFs for foreign investments, we are going to see pretty much about an 8x, uh, you know, increase in inflows as far as the domestic f uh, funds are concerned. The other interesting aspect that we also see is that, you know, uh, the AFs, like Pratibha indicated, uh, allow you to sort of bypass the FTI restriction. So how, how, how critically or how carefully we can design these structures also becomes very relevant. I think, I think those are pretty much mm -hmm. the only items. Anything um, uh, in terms of uh, LPGP negotiation? Oh, sorry. No Go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Manu Bhandari from Market Capital. So my question is uh, from SEBI and generally from the government, we're seeing 
some regimes which broadly support foreign investment coming into the country and hence we're seeing a lot of improvements in the AF regime for example investors like us and fund managers like us you know we are seeing a situation where sometimes the bridge between competing regimes is not clearly defined so what I'm referring to is for example the REIT regime uh, and the bridge of the REIT regime to the AF regime seems to be missing so any thoughts on how to understand these gaps and what can we do as GPs to prepare ourselves as to how these bridges are likely to be formed? So uh, Manu, I think uh, to summarize the response, see the point is that uh, India is still, you know, take its uh, first steps into formal REITs being launched, etc. And clearly what we have seen is that the securities regulator has been very open to take market feedback. Uh, whenever somebody's been, you know, attempting uh, whether to set up a REIT or an INVIT, infrastructure trust, etc. We have seen SEBI take market feedback, come out with clarifications and relaxations to encourage some of these structures also to get launched. Uh, once we see a, a live example of somebody, you know, going live with a REIT or an INVIT for that matter, if they still see some challenges as to how to migrate or some of the other operators want to migrate to a REIT, then we, we believe SEBI would take pragmatic views, again keeping in mind the different considerations including investor protection, uh, what should be the right ticket size, who should be the right eligible investor, etc. I think some of those balances will have to be struck. But clearly we see a lot of uh, pragmatism from the current securities regulator and the government and we believe a bridge will also emerge once we see both sides of the bridge to begin with. And yeah? both of these are regulated by the same regulator. So, you know, that makes it much easier to, you know, finally, if there needs to be any rationalization. Remember, they both grew at the same time. They kind of, you know, people were pushing the AIF regime because, uh, you know, for, even for social impact funds, like we've been pushing uh, the, the AIF regime. So there were a lot of people pushing the AIF regime. And then, you know, you had the REITs, um, the, the, you know, we participated, Richard was, uh, you know, very instrumental in pushing the, the changes, some of the changes through. And uh, we saw that was happening in parallel. And we've also like, when we, we read both of them, we're like, you know, you can use either. So, uh, for example, when we were uh, advising the government in setting up, uh, we're advising various arms of the government setting up funds, and uh, they themselves are confused. You know, when do you use an invit? When do you use an uh, infrastructure AIF? So, <laughs> um, they're enabling currently uh, but like Richie said if 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 you if we've seen in the last two years a sea change in attitude in the government in terms of uh, discussions if you have if you have something you can take to them and say listen do this and I assure you you know um, 200 million dollar investments coming through in the next three years they're going to take you very seriously even a small amount like that, but you, you tell them this, and I assure you this is going to happen, this is going to lead to a, a multiplier effect. Um, they, they're giving appointments, they're listening, and they're making changes in regulations. The number of regulatory changes that we have seen industry push through in the last two years has not happened in the last 10 years. And actually it's just not regulatory. Like for all of these vehicles, there were the feedback that they were getting was there were a lot of tax hurdles. These are obviously domestic tax hurdles and um, just in terms of the tax that was being here on withholding or when SPV level and things like that. But the last two budgets, especially this budget, has seen uh, important recommendations being heard and they reacted on it. They actually made things simpler. So overall, uh, there has been, they are listening and putting out the laws slowly maybe in some cases but they're definitely getting feedback on a lot of things and they're acting on it okay. so i think uh, uh, i'm sorry for uh, interrupting a bit but uh, some time ago i had called from uh, the minister from mauritius he's still in the parliament <laughs> and um, so harvish sigulam is the head of the fspa he would be addressing us so maybe you can ask him to call you and uh, your phone. No, I think that there, there is a number given for public announcement. That number two zero four. I think from there. Just see that if it could be done, and we can hear. So, but in the meanwhile, let's continue. Um, just uh, 
uh, what issues you see that drives uh, LPGP uh, relationship at this point in time? Richie or Pratibha, you can just talk about it. You know. So I think uh, some of the themes we discussed, clearly co-investments is the way to go as far as the LPRs are concerned. Uh, they clearly see this as a great way to have deeper participation, subsidizing the fees, the carry allocation that the manager charges. So uh, clearly that is one thrust that any institutional raise would definitely feature in a GP's uh, things to sort of watch out for. Uh, the other aspect that we have oh, been seeing that. is around uh, uh, management fee offsets. Again, there we see that you know uh, the two that the manager charges, uh, clearly the in institutional investors at least have been asking that if you get any transaction fees, if you get any fees to be by being by virtue of being on the board of any of the portfolio companies, or if there is any uh, uh, you know uh, investment banking fees that you generate for getting other investors into the portfolio company that is allocable to the fund, then in that case, we would definitely want to net all those inflows against the management fee that you're charging. Again, this is a feature where the LPs are on the table to negotiate the terms with the fund manager. If you are relying on a very retail raise, then clearly, you know, the, but the participation from the LP may not be, single investor may not be, still be deep enough to negotiate all these terms. But clearly, these are features that any DFI or a institutional raise will definitely see today. Uh, the other feature that we have seen is that because there has been a lot of attrition in the Indian fund management industry, we clearly see a lot of focus on uh, key man provisions. We see a lot of pro, you know, focus on uh, having for cause removals, without cause removals also. Obviously, the LP threshold that you need for a without cause removal is significantly high. We see haircut on the carry. We see uh, haircut on the other economics that the manager is entitled to in case some of these attritions were to sort of uh, come about. Uh, we see a lot of focus also on uh, the successor fund clauses. Clearly, the LPs know that, okay, if you are one of those chosen GPs who is, um, you know, uh, uh, raising from a lot of LPs out there and are creating a lot of uh, interest, they would want you to retain focus. They would want you to have a very well-articulated uh, co-investment strategies. They would want you to have uh, well-written, uh, you know, structures on how you allocate investments from different funds. If, let's say, you have sector expertise in early stage, uh, etc and let's say you are concurrently managing two or three funds uh, something could be you know at the deep end of their commitment period some could be just closed they would want to see the ratios in which you allocate across different funds come out very clearly early in the day when you're yet marketing the fund so i think i think uh, clearly it's a it's a it's the the investors are the lps you know from us euro primarily and some of the themes that you would see in any um, you know asia pack fund would resonate very well even with an India fund. So the themes continue to be the same. Mm -hmm. So while uh, the phone is getting connected, uh, uh, if there is any comment or question or uh, any experience sharing or whatever it is, the most welcome. Seems I think there is nothing. And um, but. Um, any, any particular trend in LPGP negotiations you see? New, no, anything more you want to say, Richie? So I think uh, I just highlighted some of the terms that we have seen. Apart from that, uh, we have not seen that much uh, deeper reference of ILPA, the Institutional LP Association standard so far. Clearly some of the ILPA asks have been too tough for managers, not just in India but even globally to meet. So we clearly see that, okay, it's a useful benchmark to have. But uh, just like uh, GPs, globally Indian GPs may not be able to meet all the benchmarks set out. Uh, so, so, but again, that's a good reference point for uh, any GP when he's looking to, you know, fundraise. Just see where he is uh, as far as the ILPA standards are concerned. 